If there's one thing that fans of One Piece love to do, it's probably discussing One Piece theories. For a story to go on for so long, so successfully, it needs something to keep its audience hooked at all times, and while the world building of One Piece is good enough to do so, what is truly the main selling point are the mysteries of this world. With Egghead finally having concluded, and the viewers and readers finally having a good insight into the five elders, several theories have come to the forefront. Some think the elders are demons from the underworld, some think they're mythical zones, and and some are perpetually confused. But a theory that needs more traction is the one about the elder, Saint Shepherd Jew Peter, who might just be a traitor to the world government and on the side of Joy Boy. And this is a theory with a lot of bases, be it within the story or the lore. In today's video, we'll be taking a deep dive into this theory, breaking it down, and analyzing every instance and situation that points towards Jew Peter being an enemy of the world government. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Oda has a tendency to keep a traitor in his groups. What does Konjuro from Akazaya 9 have in common with Korazan from the Don Quixote Pirates, Rouge from Enel's Priests, X Drake from Toby Ropo, Stussy from Cypherpole O, and the Punk 6 satellite known as York? The answer is, they're all traitors to their respective groups. And if we're not talking about traitors or double agents per se, we get even more examples of classified groups having someone with different values who do not side with those that they should side with. For example, Sanji is different among all all his brothers and runs away with the Vin Smoke family. Pudding operated against the wishes of her mother to help Sanji get back with his crew in the Whole Cake Island arc. Vivi was secretly working against Baroque works during her time as Miss Wednesday. All these instances present to us a pattern where several organizations across One Piece often have a mole. Joy Boy probably failed because someone betrayed him, so it only makes sense for the world government, created under Emu, to eventually fall with someone from top management itself working against them. And this is where Jew Peter comes in. It's not necessary that a member of the Gorose has to have a traitor lurking within, but it is likely because we do see bits and pieces of foreshadowing throughout the story, especially if it's presented as a big plot twist. For example, before we found out about Kanjuro's betrayal, we also saw him drawing with his left hand instead of his right, despite being right-handed. He even drew a dragon to help the Straw Hats climb up Zo, despite being a retainer of Odin, who had been killed by Kaido. And Kanemon did point out how the choice of animal had left a sour taste in his mouth. What did he do after that? He went on to cover Kanemon's eyes from behind as a joke, and the two of them plummeted downwards. In Dressrosa, Doflamingo had put up a bounty on all the Straw Hats and their allies, except Kanjuro. The story is littered with such instances of foreshadowing, so hypothetically speaking, if a Gorose member were to be a traitor, Oda would definitely foreshadow it, and he has, either by relying on lore, or actions, or design, or direction. And he's done so multiple times, so let's go over these instances. How does Jew Peter stand out among the elders? For starters, we have Jew Peter's appearance. Very simple and straightforward. He, unlike the other Gorose members, does not look that old. He probably is, since the elders were kind of immortal unless Emu kills them, but he doesn't look the part like Saturn, Nosduro, Warkiri, and Mars. Why appearance matters here is, once again, because of the pattern. Kanduro looked visibly different from the Akazaya 9 members due to his kabuki makeup. Meanwhile, Stussy was the only woman among the masked assassins of CP0. Even Corazon stood out among the elite guards of the Don Quixote pirates, despite everyone having very unique designs. If you look at other such situations where the difference isn't physically apparent, you will see that the potential traitor or deserter stands out because they're different. Sanji was believed to be completely human among the Vinsmoke siblings. Pudding was a member of the nearly extinct Three-Eyed Tribe, back to Corazon who never spoke, and York was the only Vegapunk who didn't engage in any science-based work. All in all, whoever betrayed their respective organization was always made to stand out in some way or another. Based on visual design alone, Ju Peter stands out among the Gorose. He's also the least interactive Gorose, with him barely having a dialogue in Egghead. In fact, his interactions are never as aggressive or hostile as that of other Gorose. During one instance, Ju Peter says this phrase, then the war will finally be over. For all we know, the war was over 800 years ago when the world government defeated Joy Boy. However, Joy Boy made his promise and the world waited for its return because the side of the Great Kingdom was still unfinished. The war was lost only temporarily for them, as the likes of Zunesha and the Iron Giant Emith continued to await Joy Boy's return. With Jupiter implying that the war isn't over yet, this raises some questions. There is also Jupiter's name, and no, we're not talking about the planet. His name is strategically split into two halves with Jew 
and Peter. And One Piece has been taking heavy inspiration from Christianity and the Bible when it comes to the five elders and those that they have been associated with. For example, the Holy Land of Marie Joie, emphasis on the word holy, which is known as the Land of the Gods, has the Eve tree running through it. The elders were summoned to Egghead using satanic pentagrams, and we know that there are cultists who believe in the existence of Satan and use pentagrams to try and summon him since that is what Brooke found when he reached Nakamura Island after being sent there by Kuma. The concept of devil fruits also alludes to the devil, so on and so forth. Long story short, Christianity is heavily referenced throughout the story, so it would be no surprise if that extended to the elders. There is also the recurring pattern where anything good is branded evil and demonic, while anything bad is branded as divine. Like Marie Joie being the land of the gods, all while hosting demonic beings such as Emu and the elders. The abominable celestial dragons carry the word celestial in their branding and are revered as gods. Meanwhile, people such as Robin are called the devil's child as she is the only one who can read ponyglyphs and by extension, access the sinister truth of the world. Goldie Roger, who was a good person, was hated and presented as an evil pirate to the world. For all we know, devil fruits could have been known as god fruits back in the day, but Emu just flipped the order. With that and the heavy Christian themes in mind, let us assume Emu as Jesus in this context since they want to fake being the good guy. On the other hand, we have Jew Peter, a possible traitor, and who was it that betrayed Jesus? Judas. Meanwhile, Peter had denied knowing Jesus thrice. Either way, these were two of his apostles who proved to be disloyal to Jesus. Jew Peter's name could very much be inspired by Judas and Peter, with him being the traitor to Emu. But his name comes with another giveaway, and for this, we address the term shepherd instead of Jew Peter. Shepherd refers to someone from the working class instead of a world noble. The elite are not as concerned with being freed and liberated in comparison to those who are being made to work or slave. To top that off, the other Gorosei members have names that denote higher ranks. Nusjuro's family name, Ethan Baron, refers to a baron, with barons being part of the British nobility. Marcus Mars refers to the Marquis, once again a position among the British nobility. Top Man Warkiri quite literally has Top Man in his name. Saturn's family name, Jay Garcia, possibly takes from the Iberian surname Garcia, which has been a significant name with historical importance across Spain and Portugal due to its connection with nobility. Kings and queens from the 8th century often bore Garcia as their name, especially in the Kingdom of Navarre. With this, Saturn's name also gets the connection to royalty, allowing Jew Peter to stand out among the topmen, Garcia, Marquise, and Baron as the sole shepherd. Jew Peter's reaction to Gear 5. What should have been a nightmare seemed like a dream. With respect to Joy Boy, now that we've brought him up, let us go back to the reveal of Gear 5, which is marked by Zunesha claiming that Joy Boy has returned. Not all foreshadowing is plot-based or connected to the lore of a story. Filmmaking and direction techniques have often been used across visual formats such as film, television, and of course, anime and manga. For example, if a story has to foreshadow something about someone lurking in the corner, the camera will often go out of focus and change the point of view after putting the focus on a nearby object like a wall, which could be the barrier behind which a person is hiding and eavesdropping. This technique is often used throughout the anime film I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, where the female lead is eventually killed by a serial killer. Other direction tricks involve particular ways of using lighting. For example, in The Godfather, Vito Corleone, who is the mafia boss, always has this overhead lighting and only overhead lighting. What this type of lighting does is it projects the light on the head of the character, preventing the front of the face from being properly illuminated, which is aggravated by the absence of other forms of lighting. As the light hits the top of the head, it fails to reach the eyes that are located within the eye sockets, with the brow bone and the skull structure around the eye area blocking light and keeping the eyes quite literally and metaphorically in the darkness. After his son, Michael Corleone, played by Al Pacino, takes over, the exact same lighting trick is used with him. In both cases, the eyes, or the windows to the soul, are hidden. A trick like this adds a lot of mystery and intrigue to a character. Soundtrack usage and the vocal tone of an actor contribute to these factors as well. For example, Attack on Titan seems to take place in a very backward world, whereas the soundtrack has very prominent electronic and rather modern elements. Eventually, we learn about the technological developed world across the walls. With this in mind, we come back to the scene where Gear 5 is revealed as we break down the direction of the scene. As Luffy's heart begins to beat again with his fruit being awakened, he gradually takes up the white form that Joy Boy had become known for while his rubber powers get hiked up to the max. The scene cuts to Pangea Castle where the Gorose discuss having sacrificed the CP0 masked agent Guernica. Quickly, we get the gist of the fact that they're trying to avoid something, with this something being the return of Joy Boy or rather the awakening of Luffy's 
fruit, which has always been known as the Paramecia-type gum gum fruit. Nuzduro mentions how the world government has been trying to get their hands on the gum gum fruit for the past 800 years and failed at it. Right after, Mars mentions how it would not be impossible for the fruit to be the one who's avoiding them. Throughout it all, we can see the faces of four out of five Gorosei, both in the anime as well as the manga. The only face we never see throughout that scene is that of Ju Peters, who is looking at the light coming in through the window, with his back turned towards his fellow elders. This could be symbolic for the arrival of dawn once again, with the fruit having awakened, since we know that it's essentially a god fruit that represents the warrior of liberation sun god Nika. Ju Peter joins the conversation and mentions how zone type fruits have a will of their own. Right as he takes the true name of the fruit, the mythical zone type human human fruit model Nika, the drums of liberation begin to play. Ju Peter goes on to talk about Nika, as he mentions how it said his body had all the properties of rubber, how he fought as he fancied and made people smile. And finally, he hits the nail on the head when he reveals that this person is known as the warrior of liberation, sun god Nika. Do you notice how he seems to be hyping up the situation while the others mention the cons from their point of view, such as not having gotten their hands on the fruit, the fruit avoiding them, and having to eliminate a risk factor? Contrary to that, we get Ju Peter mentioning how Nika would bring a smile to everyone's faces, liberate them, and fight however he wanted to with an upbeat soundtrack and the iconic shots of Luffy's silhouette in front of the moon in the Nika pose. And the fluctuating tone of his voice sounds far more positive than the others. It almost sounds as if Ju Peter has been waiting for this day all along, much like Zunesha. Jupiter in Egghead. Being a sandworm might just be giving away his true allegiance. So finally, we come to Egghead where we see Jupiter in action for the very first time. Once again, we have several design, lore, and even plot elements that contribute to the theory of Jupiter being the traitor. Jupiter arrived in Egghead via his summoning circle alongside Mars, Nusjuro, and Warkiri to aid Saturn in battle and help prevent Vegapunk's broadcast from going live. They also have to ensure that all the Vegapunks, barring York, are killed killed and prevent the Straw Hats from escaping. When the Elders arrive, we see them transformed into what seems to be mythical zone forms. However, they don't seem to operate like Devil Fruits, so it could be a whole new thing altogether. But either way, four out of five of them are based on Yokai. Saturn is the arachnid ox demon known as the Gyuki, which is a poisonous demon from Japanese folklore. Mars is the Itsumare, a Yokai with wings, the body of a serpent, and a human face, which is revered for being a dreadful haunting spirit. Warkiri is the four-tusked boar known as Hoki, who is infamous for vandalizing towns as a demonic creature, and Nusduro is the Bakotsu, which is a ghastly and vengeful horse yokai from Japanese folklore, known for its skeletal appearance coated with green flames straight out of the underworld. Meanwhile, Jupiter is no yokai at all. He's a sandworm, which has been quite popular across modern fiction lately, most notably in the fantasy series Dune. In Dune, the sandworms were conceptually based on European dragons tasked with guarding treasure. There also seems to be a fair amount of inspiration from the Mongolian death worm, which used to exist in the Gobi Desert. As you can see, there are no cultural or symbolic ties between sandworms and yokai. However, it does tie Jupiter to Arabasta, which is based on Egypt and is a desert, and what are deserts full of? Sand. We know that the Nefertari family of Arabasta is the original royal family of the place, since Nefertari D. Lily had refused to become a celestial dragon back in the day and wished to return to Arabasta while the other ruling families across the world gave up their royal status for their godly status. This, if true, directly connects next Jupiter to the D clan. Now, whether he's just Saint Shepherd Jupiter or Shepherd D Jupiter is another discussion. One does not always need to be a D to stand against the world government, as seen with the likes of Kuma, Sabo, and Ivankov. Well, in his human form, Jupiter has a scar on his chest, which is present even after he becomes a sandworm. The location of the scar is revealed to be a cross on the sandworm's head, and although it's not exactly like the one possessed by Laboon or the whales in Fishman Island, it is quite reminiscent of it. And what did Laboon do? Crash his head into the red line to break it. So did the other whales, which resulted in that particular scar. And what happens when you break the red line? Marie-Joie falls and the all blue is formed, with waters from the north, south, east, and west blue merging with one another. It could be that Jupiter has tried to partake in the exact same act to break the red line, which is theorized to have been created by the world government to keep them hoisted up while the rest of the world is made to sink. Now, assuming Jupiter got his scar while trying to break the red line, he's still far less scarred in comparison to the whales because at some point he became an elder and as a result acquired the power to regenerate and heal. So even if he were to try the same trick again, his body would heal itself, preventing further scarring. 
As the elders arrive in Egghead and join the battle, Jew Peter proves to be the least active of them all. He does do a lot of stuff and launch attacks, but they have little to no problematic repercussions despite his monstrous strength. The sandworm fights by burrowing into the ground and ambushing his opponents by busting out from beneath. It also creates a vortex to suck everything in. Jew Peter's initial attack had him burrowing into the ground and ambushing Luffy. He takes Luffy in his mouth, but soon attacked by the Elbaf giants Dory and Brogi, who save Luffy. It could be entirely possible that Jew Peter has taken Luffy in his mouth to protect him, but of course, if that were the case, the Giants wouldn't know. Also, can we just say, based on his moveset, Jew Peter is literally a mole. Other traders have had suspicious powers as well, such as Corazon's silence fruit, Conjuro being able to draw to artificially give life to what doesn't exist, and Sanji's stealth black germa suit allowing him to go invisible. So, Jew Peter's moveset being stealthy and like that of a mole adds much weight to this theory. So, he does a bunch of other things in Egghead, but it's all a bit it's strange. When he notices that the Straw Hats and allies were trying to escape, Jew Peter creates his suction vortex to drag everyone in. This could just be a smoke show for the other Gorosei to trust him, or maybe Jew Peter is doing it intentionally because hitting the sea immediately would lead to them getting killed by another elder, provided he is a traitor to the government, that is. Eventually, Nusjuro cut the Labo phase in half, causing the Seraphims and the trapped Cypher Pole agents who had been sent to kill Vegapunk falling down to the Fabrio phase. Meanwhile, Mars had ordered the extermination of all life on the island for the sake of stopping Vegapunk's broadcast. For the Gorosei, the lives of their allies didn't matter. Be it for the Marines, the Cypherpole agents, or when Luchi wanted to save Kaku, but Mars basically didn't care. Meanwhile, Jew Peter used his vortex to suck in the now-released Cypherpole members. During this time, Peter had inhaled many of their allies, such as the Cypherpole agents who had been trapped in Egghead. He later ejected them after reaching the coast, making it very evident that he cared about their lives, unlike the other elders, with world nobles never caring about the lives of those who weren't celestial dragons. Jew Peter was also the only elder who did not use Conqueror's Hockey to knock out the transponder snails for the sake of stopping the broadcast. When they learned from York about the broadcast snail being within the Iron Giant, Jew Peter did get there with the others but took no initiative to stop it, allowing the other elders to step in. After freeing the Cypher Pole agents, Jew Peter tried to suck in the ship of the giants but was quickly stopped by Luffy who punched the elder. It was a fairly easy altercation for Luffy despite Jew Peter's ridiculous strength. He then got into an altercation with Joy Boy's Iron Iron Giant and managed to beat his arm off, once again maybe to just prove a point because Jew Peter was strong enough to fight it. Soon after, a seal within the Iron Giant was unlocked to release Joy Boy's hockey from within Emmet, which sent all the elders, barring Saturn, back to Egghead. Jew Peter could have done a lot more as someone who's great with ambush attacks, but he didn't. He just did the bare minimum to maintain his image. Does Jew Peter hail from the Void Century? Initially, we thought that all the elders were from the Void Century. Emu probably is, especially with Ivankov mentioning Nerona Emu from 800 years ago. However, we've learned now that the elders are not necessarily that old, as Saturn recalled the Iron Giant after realizing it's the same one that he had seen 200 years ago. Had he hailed from the Void Century, he would have known the giant from that time period. Meanwhile, if Jew Peter is a mole for Joy Boy, then he must be someone from that time like Zunisha, because he would need complete context for everything and was probably very close to Joy Boy and a key player in the war because why else would you infiltrate the Gorosei of all places? He probably became an elder early when he joined Emu during that time and, as a result, is the only young-looking elder. And if you need another convincing argument, Saint Peter, who was an apostle of Emu, had been crucified in Rome by Emperor Nero. Meanwhile, the ruler of the world that Jew Peter is, or I guess has to be subservient to, is allegedly known as Nerona Emu. Marvelous Verdict! And with that, we hope we've been able to entertain you with a great theory. Of course, nothing is set in stone and anything is possible. And of course, this is a fan theory, so it might be nothing but a big, fat reach. But it could also be true, and if it is, then hopefully we'll get wind of more such instances of foreshadowing that Oda has secretly left within his story. With that, today's video comes to an end. We want to know what you think about this fan theory in the comments down below. Please let us know, and let us know if there's any other One Piece fan theories you want us to explore. Explore. This is Wizard Wheezy signing off for now, but thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.